Okay. We have seen the following. Let me focus on the boost in the extraction, just to set the stage. Boost in extraction. What we had was, say, C K1 was in the Lorentz space. And the one associated with this in the spinor space was sigma k1 mu, right? So the sign convention. And here, tangent <coughs> c was minus beta. If you would like to associate the physical parameters with the mathematical parameters. So let's remember the definition of the K1. Instead of writing it from the notes, I would like to construct it for you so that you could really see how nice and simple they are. This matrix was 0, 1, 1, 0, zeros all over the place. So sigma mu nu. So if you read it from there, K1. 0, 1 was plus 1, k1, 1, 0 was again plus 1, right? You read it from the matrix and use the matrix notation carefully. So what does it mean for the super indices k1, 0, 1? I'm using this bracket so to be on the safe side. You don't have to if you feel comfortable about this. Huh? This is minus 1, right? Then you raise this up. And for the second one, k1, when you raise this one up, it doesn't change anything, so it is plus one. So this reduction is easily done. Sigma mu nu, k1 mu nu is sigma zero one. Zero one, which is minus one. Plus one zero and one zero. I'm, the repeated indices are summed over, so I sum over the mu's and nu's. Okay, so this is altogether minus two zero one, two sigma zero one because anti because of the anti symmetry. So if you raise these indices, because we have defined sigma mu nu or in terms of the contravariant gammas, so if I raise this up, it is twice sigma zero one. Obviously. And sigma zero one was I over two gamma zero and gamma one. Again, using the anti-symmetry, it is I times gamma zero gamma one. Gamma one super is gamma zero times the alpha. So it is I times alpha X. Remember I told you that alpha, uh, for the alphas, I always use the Cartesian notation and in order to be on the safe side, it's always good to use x, y, and z. So this sigma mu nu, k1 mu nu is altogether twice times i times alpha x. And finally, I can finish the discussion and write the s associated s is a to the minus i over 4 omega. Perhaps I should use the same notation, omega and omega in there. It doesn't matter. Same omega. Signs are the same. e to the minus i over 4 times 2i <coughs> alpha x. So it is minus and minus. There is i squared is minus. So it's altogether plus e to the 1 half omega alpha x. And tangent omega is minus the beta. Okay, so these are the conventions that I have, all right? Fine.
It's indeed her mission, right? Because there is no I, alpha is her mission, it is her mission, etc. So if I would like to now write it in a four by four matrix form, I expand this and use the fact that alpha x squared is one, so alpha x cubed is alpha x, etc. So what does it mean that this particular S is? This is just the K1, right? S of K1, a better notation in, in agreement with our previous notation is this, one over two omega alpha x. So it is one plus omega over two alpha x plus one over two factorial omega two squared alpha x squared etc. This is identity. So you see how the things are going. So there is an identity overall. So one plus one over two factorial omega over two squared plus alpha x omega over two. Well, this is again sine is plus here because there is the one over three factorial. So omega over two cube. So finally, I have co identity times cosine hyperbolic omega over two plus alpha x sine hyperbolic omega over two. Okay, so that's the two by two form. So, I'm sorry, four by four matrix form of the boost in the x direction. I can generalize it immediately to an arbitrary direction, but here, what is the point? The point is, here the tangent hyperbolic omega is minus beta. So if I go to now, to the inverse, this is the S. This is the S going from the K to K prime. Whereas I need the inverse of it, right? I need the S which is going from K prime frame to K, the inverse one. So the inverse of this lambda is S of lambda inverse. And lambda inverse means you are changing the V going to minus V, right? Because it is V that way. So how does it change? If the V changes sign, it is this thing which changes sign, right? For the K1, for the specific case of K1. You see, it was rather fast to go from uh, the, the constructed one to back to the, uh, the relevant configuration. And what I need to, now, to do now is the following. I need to determine these parameters in terms of what? In terms of the original parameters, which is tangent hyperbolic omega is equal to beta. So I change the sign. So I will use the following trigonometric relationship. I have already done, perhaps written down, that down before. Let me write it once more. Tangent hyperbolic omega over two in terms of the tangent uh, hyperbolic omega is equal to one plus, I hope you can drive such relationship on your own instead of looking at the tables. half the angle and full angle. Because full angle is the one which depends on the beta now. This is beta divided by one, one minus beta squared. Okay. Can I convert them into energies and momenta? Let me do that. What is the energy? Energy is gamma mc squared. Right? The gamma is the famous Einstein factor here. Uh, 
Uh, momentum is the same. MV divided by that square root, so gamma MV. Okay. Therefore, if I, for instance, take the ratio of P over E, what do I get? The magnitude of P divided by the energy here is gamma's cancel, and you have V over C squared. What is V over C? V, let me use the beta, V over C, one of the, V over C is beta, so it is one over C beta. So whenever you have beta, you can convert it into that ratio, right? So beta is CP over E, if you want. P is the magnitude of the P vector, okay. So, tangent hyperbolic omega over 2 is, the, in the numerator I have the beta which is CP over E, and in the denominator I have 1 plus 1 over gamma, right? 1 over gamma is what? Here, I can solve from here 1 over gamma. It is 1 plus 1 over gamma. So let me determine 1 over gamma from there. mc squared over e. You see, all of a sudden, that geometrical factor, tangent hyperbolic omega over 2, which is needed in here, if I factor sin, cosine hyperbolic omega over 2, one, no, I, I have to write it in here because I have inverted, I have, I have entered the relevant one. Cosine hyperbolic omega over two, one minus alpha x tangent hyperbolic omega over two. That is why I had to compute that factor because I, I, had, I need that tangent hyperbolic omega over 2 in there. Let me s simplify this. So it is Cp divided by E plus mc squared, correct? If I multiply both the numerator and denominator by the E. Let me now try to simplify this even further. What about the Cp? Do I, can I solve it? Yes. Energy momentum dispersion relation is this expression, right? plus m squared c to the 4. So if I determine c squared p squared, c squared p squared is e squared minus m squared to the c to the 4. So if I substitute that up, then I get what? Let me use it here as a shorthand. This is Inside the square root, I write it as e squared minus m squared c to the 4, which you can write the product of plus and minus. So it is e minus mc squared divided by e plus mc squared, if you want, which is a very, quite a nice form, isn't it? Now, one, one more thing. I need to also write this overall factor, which will play an important role in the... We can all follow, right? In the normalization. So how do I do that? I will need this portion, so let me erase here. What is the... Cosine squared omega over 2 minus sine squared omega over 2 is equal to 1, right? That's the hyperbolic uh, trigonometry standard definition. If I factor cosine squared hyperbolic omega over 2 and write it as 1 minus tangent squared hyperbolic omega over 2 is 1, therefore cosine hyperbolic omega over 2 is 1 over 1 minus tangent hyperbolic omega over 2. If you have computed the tangent hyperbolic omega over 2, 
then you can substitute in here and see what you get. Let's take the square of that expression and write it as 1 over divided by 1 minus the square of it is just lift the square root e minus mc squared divided by e plus mc squared. That e plus mc squared goes up and the difference is what? mc squared minus minus mc squared twice mc squared. So this is a beautiful expression which is e plus mc squared divided by 2mc squared. It's going to be related to the normalization eventually. So this is the cosine hyperbolic omega over 2 and the tangent hyperbolic omega over 2 is there. And our S inverse, the relevant S inverse, which I'm going to multiply the rest solutions is then the following. The S, so let me use it symbolically as such, saying that it is going in the opposite direction, is cosine hyperbolic omega over 2, as given here, times mon minus alpha x tangent hyperbolic omega over 2, as given in there. I have worked this out in detail for the very specific case of a, an object moving in the x direction. If the thing was moving in an arbitrary direction, how do I do that? That is my original particle I have chosen for illustrating quickly everything. I have chosen it to be moving in the x direction. If it was moving in an arbitrary direction, what is the kind of modification which I need to do? The kind of modification which I need to do is replacing the s, the, the, the s originally remember it was S was e to the for the relevant minus v e to the minus a half omega alpha x. So I replace it with the minus one over two omega omega. Let me write omega and n dot alpha. What is this n? This n is the direction of the velocity, right? So it is the v, which is v over the magnitude. And this omega is the usual omega. Tangent hyperbolic omega is the beta. Okay. So how that, in, what happens to that expression? That expression becomes now Cosine hyperbolic omega over 2, those portions are not changed, times i minus v unit dot alpha, so v dot alpha divided by the v tangent hyperbolic omega over 2. Okay. Very good. So what do I do next? I can proceed as it is, or I can do a bit of further simplification if you want, using still the kinematics. V dot V. Okay, the further simplification will be the following. Let's remember this, tangent hyperbolic. I would like to, I was planning to skip that, but let's not do that. 
Tangent hyperbolic omega over 2 is Cp divided by E plus Mc squared. So we have this multiplying it. That is V dot V dot tangent hyperbolic is C V P divided by E plus mc squared. What is this v vector, v unit vector times the p? It is the p vector itself, right? cp e plus mc squared. Okay, so this v dot alpha thing becomes then the entire thing v dot alpha divided by the v magnitude of tangent hyperbolic omega over 2 becomes C P divided by the V magnitude plus E over MC squared. Okay. CP. My measures are correct. This V magnitude shouldn't have been in here. Do you notice that? Somehow that stick out as an extra. Tangent hyperbolic is this. There's the alpha now V dot alpha. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I'm really sorry. If it is a V vector, it is full V divided by the V. Okay. There is no, if it, this is fine. When this is V dotted into A divided magnitude, but here I am taking the unit vector. Unit vector is the V full divided, because otherwise I would be, I was having something wrong in here, an additional one. V unit is the V full divided by the magnitude, fine. So we are more or less finished. Let me carry it over here. You're fine. So, S of minus V is now the cosine hyperbolic omega over 2. I leave it as it is because that's related to normalization, but inside is done. So, 1 minus, 1 minus, Cp dot alpha, Cp dot alpha divided by E mc squared is the transformation. Good, fine. What I will do next is I will take this transformation and act on the spinors at rest and find the moving spinors. So this is acting on e to the minus i over h bar mc squared t 1 0 0 0 
comma zero 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 one zero zero one for the positive energies and minus I over H bar minus MC squared T zero zero one zero 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 one. So when this acts on those, it will give me the spinor expressions for arbitrary move, arbitrarily moving Dirac particle with the velocity v. I hope you appreciated how ingenious the method is, starting with the rest and by boosting in the inverse direction and generating the S's. Here, perhaps before uh, multiplying the matrices, I have to carry out uh, uh, some a covariantization procedure for these exponentials. What are the exponentials? Well, for both, I over h bar, epsilon r, mc squared t, right? Epsilon r is defined plus one for r equals one and two for the upper two components associated with the positive energy ones and minus one for the three and four. Okay, so these are the things. These are in the rest frame, right? In the rest frame, I have, let me consider the following expression. In general, x mu, p mu. If I go to the rest frame, this will be the x mu rest and p mu rest. Can I do that? Yes, because these are relativistic invariants. I can determine it, it in any frame I like. They will all have the same value in any frame I like, right? So what is this momentum now in the rest frame? The momentum in the rest frame means the particle is not moving. The space part of the momentum is zero. It is the energy rest divided by C and zero. That's the definition of the momentum for vector at rest. No motion in there and rest energy. What is the rest energy? MC squared, right? Always. MC squared divided by C is MC, MC comma zero. That is the expression. So if I now combine these, I have the CT at rest times MC, correct? Well, that's MC squared T rest. But that T is the time in here, right? When I was looking of the rest solution, obviously uh, the time is measured by that rest observer. So. Originally, this T of mine is nothing but this T, TR. So this TMC squared is equal to X mu P mu in an arbitrary frame. It's always equal to that one. So this all together, this entire thing becomes, I will write it in here so that it's visible, e to the minus i over h bar epsilon r x mu p mu. Isn't that beautiful? So we have that factor handled. So that factor is sitting there and then I am multiplying this matrix to those solutions. Once the overall factor is taken care of, depending on of course whether r equals one and, one and two or three and four, that's to be kept in mind. Then I can take the matrix S, which is appropriately constructed, and multiply it with the 100 zero zero and stuff like that. So here is the matrix that I have.
What is this matrix now? Uh, let me uh, define a shorthand. I will define a shorthand in the following manner. Define C is equal to, this C is something else now, that's a new C. C P divided by E plus M C squared. So that, that is C times P hat times alpha. So with that definition, I have this C P at alpha. So what is this matrix now? Perhaps you would, you would like to see the form of that matrix. There is a one, now two dimensional one, minus C P dot sigma in here, minus C P dot sigma in here, and that's an identity. So that's the form of the matrix. If this is the form of the 4x4 four four matrix in 2x2 two two blocks, I have to multiply this with that first. Well, I will call the first number 1, second number 2, or perhaps I will do the following. 1 plus is the there's one, one minus this, two plus and two minus, okay. So this matrix is multiplying this upper one. This times that, and this times that. Is one zero for the upper part, because this times that is taken, the identity is taken one and zero, then this, times that again okay here is a not that nice looking expression but that's really the expression I have and what about the one minus oh I don't like that one plus two plus one plus and two plus is 0, 1 minus C P dot sigma 0, 1. And similarly for the 3 and 4. Three plus three minus now. Three. Well three minus minus. So it is a little more involved than this. Now you take this and multiply with the zero, zero, one, zero. So it is this one which is coming up. Minus C P dot sigma one zero. Now this is acting on there. There's that one. And finally, for minus C P dot sigma zero one minus zero one. These are my four solutions, and the overall factor in the front for the first one is epsilon r, as the epsilon r is plus one, and the overall factor in front of these are e to the minus i over h bar x mu p mu, and the exponential in front of these are minus plus i over h bar x mu p mu, are the arbitrary moving solutions. So we have found the spinors nicely. And what next? The next one is the following. I will write in the remaining 15 minutes. I will list the properties and I will ask you to verify them. Verify them, not construct them. So it shouldn't be that frightening. 
So I write the solution now, psi r of x, I define it to be wrp e to the minus i over h bar epsilon r x mu p mu. I have just introduced w if factoring out the exponential, that famous exponential I factored out. And I want you to verify the following. Verify p slash minus epsilon r mc wrp is equal to zero. I encourage you to directly use the construction. That is, this one is S of minus V times the rest solution, right? That's a safe way of doing it. Because apart from the exponentials, which is the energy ex exponential part, this is obtained by acting on the rest solutions, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, uh, and on by that operator, which is nicely obtained explicitly. If you try to do this by looking at those explicit solutions, you may make mistakes and then you blow the expert. If there is a dangerous procedure that you are bound to make mistakes, you blow everything. Don't do that. Try to do it in this closed form. So that's the first. Second. WR bar obtained by multiplying this solution, taking the dagger and multiplying it from right by the gamma zero. P slash minus epsilon R MC is equal to zero. That's the second equation satisfied by the WR bar. And third, WR bar P WR prime of P is equal to delta R R prime epsilon R. That's a rather interesting expression. Notice that epsilon R is coming into a game so that if it is one, one, two, and one, two, the sign is plus three, four, and three, four, because there are four of them. The sign should come out to be minus. And finally, I will write it up. Finally, the fourth one, one, two, and three, and four. R equals from one to four, epsilon R. So a sign plays an important role. W R alpha P W R bar. Notice that bar is to the right, so it's a matrix, right? If bar is to the left and the other is to the right, it's a number, C number. And if the orders are changed, you get a matrix. Bar beta, delta alpha beta. And demonstrating those things require, demonstrating all of them requires that you have to use this definition for the safest way. And also, uh, I could have introduced projectors, but uh, there's no need for that. If uh, need arises, I can construct button step by step and ask it in the exam. But so it's a good place to stop. If I had another half an hour, I could have give you hints to demonstrate this. But if you use this expression, you should it shouldn't take more than one hour altogether to demonstrate all these four properties, please do that because it gives you a feeling on what is the form of the, these spinors at motion. Notice that the spinors at motion have the form of a 
being eigenspinor of the p slash operator, right? If you write this as an eigenvalue equation, moving this constant to the right, p slash acting on wr is equal to epsilon r times mc times r omega r itself. So these are really eigenspinors of the p slash operator. This and its conjugate. And this is what? This is sort of the orthogonality of these spinors. And this is the completeness involving all four of them. So all four of them constitute a complete set. But this completeness requires that you distinguish between the plus positive energy and negative energy solutions because at the articles three and four, there is a relative sign minus in here, right? W1, W1 bar, W2, W2 bar minus W3, W3 bar minus W4, W4 bar. So completeness is a subtle completeness and the positive energy and negative energy solutions enter into the game in a slightly different manner. And it's for you to enjoy yourself. Now, I have 10 minutes remaining. Perhaps as this is the last hour, you may wish to discuss some, anything related to this particular session or the previous ones because we have two more, two more exams ahead of us. And that time we are going to have full complete exams, not those type of previous type of exams, you know. So it was a special gift. Okay. Kamil? Okay. Comments, questions, points? These are assigned as private homeworks. You know what it means, right? Assigning private homeworks. Non-relativistic limits are different than classical limits. Going to classical limits means you can still are, you are at high speeds, high energies, but it's classical versus quantum. Going to non-relativistic limit means you stay in quantum mechanics but go to the small speeds. Perhaps I should write that block diagram. Newton, Einstein, Schrodinger, and Dirac. Bazı arkadaşlar dertli bu kadar. Ha şekerim. So Newton to Einstein, you have to go from Einstein to Newton, for instance. You take one over C, goes to zero, right? And you just stay in that column. And if you're here, Dirac to Schrodinger, again the same, right? You take one over C goes to zero, right? Because this is high speed, that's low speeds. Relativistic, non-relativistic. This is the relativistic line. That is the non-relativistic line. So whichever point you start at this line, you have to take always one over C goes to zero. Okay, now this is the quantum line. That is the classical line. Whichever side you are in doesn't matter. How, how do you go from classical to quantum along this direction? You take h bar goes to the limit in that direction, right? So there are two procedures. So if you are asked to start with the Dirac and go to non-relativistic, you go up that direction. You go to the Schrodinger by taking one over C goes to zero. Or again, if you are asked to start from Dirac, go to Einstein like the Lorentz force equation in the presence of electromagnetic interactions, and then you take 
h bar goes to zero. Or you just take the expectation values naturally, right? That's the quantum, the classical. The quantum operator equations and classical expectation values satisfy similar equations. Quantum equations, Heisenberg. Or classical equations, RFS theorem, expectation values. So if you keep that block diagram in your mind and reflect for a few minutes before jumping into the problem. <laughs> Please don't jump into the problem. Think about it and then jump, okay. So uh, it's so important that not only in the context of exam, understanding the entire package of this course requires that you understand those subtleties. So this was a global comment because I noticed that there is a bit of confusion in that, so I wanted to comment on it. If you have other comments, other points of clarification, you can always ask after the class. If you have any questions, please come and consult with me, okay, instead of any further things. So I think it's a good point to stop. So one semester is also over. I hope you enjoyed it. Well, some of you did enjoy it, I know. Some perhaps didn't, not didn't. Well, we cannot make everybody happy anyway. Huh? <laughs>